Welcome to this Onward Q&A panel. My name is Ben. I will be one of the moderators for you today. I'm very excited to have you all join us today. Um, I'd love to see in the chat where you are all from. Uh, first, I want to thank Maria, Ray, and Drew for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we're really, we're really uh, looking forward to having them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when we're doing this. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, looking forward to having them. We were looking forward to having them in the gallery, but uh, this, although we couldn't have had the original event, I'm really glad that we were able to do this next best thing. Uh, they were kind enough to sign book plates for all the people who bought books. So thank, thank you guys again for that. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you guys and see what kind of scenes and stuff you guys uh, brought to share with us. Um, and, and just you know, looking forward to seeing all the great art. Uh, I personally really love the movie and I was surprised at how emotional the film ended up being and uh, was really glad to have it when quarantine began. So, oh, yeah, that's right. A few quick guidelines. Everybody, please stay muted during, the, uh, during this thing. Uh, you can also turn off your own camera, so save bandwidth if you like. Uh, you're welcome to type in a question in the chat box at any time, if time allows. Towards the end, we'll try to get to We'll try to get to some of them. Uh, please bear with us in case there's any technical difficulties. Just let us know if there's anything weird or off in the chat. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome the author, the editor of the art book, and your moderator for today, Drew Taylor, who will be introducing our guests. Thank you for that amazing introduction, Ben. So good. and. I've never heard you say anything, you get emotional about anything. So that, that Onward was able to do that, I think is, is a great accomplishment. Uh, yes, uh, I wrote the uh, Art of Onward book and I'm so excited that everybody's gonna get their signed copies. And I'm so excited we finally got to do this because we were supposed to do it the week that everything kind of went down the tube. So this is really exciting and we could not be joined by any more exciting guests. We've got Maria Yi, who is a visual development artist at Pixar and did character design on this movie and is going to show you some amazing stuff. And also showing you some amazing stuff is Lee Tang, who is a story artist on the, the movie. And I didn't get to talk to either of you guys while writing the book, so I'm so excited that we can talk now. So uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to them. We're going to, I'm going to interject some questions every once in a while, and then I'll take some questions from the chat. Uh, at the very end if we have time and um yeah so take it away guys uh so maria and i flipped the coin i think i'm going first <laughs> um okay i'm gonna share a screen sorry i always fumble through you know sorry everybody all right okay does anyone see this what do you see i'm seeing uh unicorns eating out of the garbage okay and that's it right Oh, sorry. No, 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 Lee, we are looking at your navigator page. You gotta reshare it. This one? It's this one. Is this right? Yes, yes. no, you, you got it. Yeah, mm -hmm. forget all that happened right before. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so I was sort of artist on, on the Onward. I was on for almost three years. So from like the first screening, it was years ago to like, I think it was sixth or seventh, forget. We gone for like eight, eight screenings at Pixar. So like a, um, it's just kind of a key component of the movie is the world, right? Talking about the world, and it's, it's a key component of storytelling in general is examining the world. So with Onward, it was a mix. It was a mix of modern and fantasy, and which was a lot of the funnest parts of the movie is kind of dealing. So, these are just kind of like examinations of jokes and ideas I had while I was working on the movie. And a lot of it didn't make it in, but some of it did. Like I think a version of this kind of made it in. And like when I play around with this kind of stuff, <coughs> I really like to get weirdly granular, like uh, and get like details and stuff like people might not even notice. Like I have this like loot lessons thing on the, on the, the page here. Oh, all right. uh, just, and just playing around with the world, just coming up with different gags, really helps you inform what's gonna, what the, it's gonna feel like. So the, the complication of the movie was this balance of uh, modern and mundane. 
I'm sorry, modern and fantasy, because this is the world and, you know, we always wanted to have a bit of each, modern and fantasy in, in every kind of scene and every idea as much as we can. We didn't want to neglect one or the other at, at any point. So it was always just combining all these aspects uh, in every scene and just having those kinds of thinkings when we're going through the movie. This idea was one of the jokes that did not make it into the movie, unfortunately. <clears throat> so to kind of get into kind of the storytelling, more storyboarding kind of the uh, contextual aspects of it. So the creative process is messy. It's not clean from start to finish. It goes backwards, forwards, all over the place, right? And this is why it was such a long process. Like Pixar takes so many years to make these movies, but it's evolved, the story evolves, it changes, it, it takes a left turn here, right turn here, and big stuff, small stuff, that kind of stuff changes. Not everything changes, but you know, it, it goes through these massagings and twists and turns. So um, legendary Pixar story guru, Joe Ramp, used to say storyboarding is the art of reading storyboarding. And that's because of the messiness of these stories or like the, the, the indirect creation of stories. So we would put the movie up, break it down. Uh, here's a thing from the, the book, All right, This is from the book, I'm oh, sorry, I kind of went ahead. Uh, this is from the book. This is kind of an interesting chart of the progression of the movie, like all the stages. And you can see like the treatment, which is the kind of the initial idea Dan had, uh, Dan Scanlon, the director, started in 2015 in the movie, uh, the last screening, it was in 2019. So that's, that's four years of this movie, continually changing, evolving, becoming something else, putting up ideas, seeing how they feel, tearing them down, and just repeating that for years. So that's why it's storyboard is reboarding, because we reboard a thing, react to it, have other people react to it, examine it, see what works and what doesn't, tear it down and start again. Like for example, Ian was the main character so in the treatment. And this is even before I got on the show, it was a scientist. Um, so that, and then eventually I switched over to magic. Ian was a magic fanatic with his brother Barley. And we even had, we even started the movie at a lot of early screenings where it was, uh, they were children and you saw their love of magic persist since then. And this is the main character, like so often in these processes, we're continually rethinking the main character, trying to figure out what, who the main character is, what their issues and fears and hopes and journey is, and because that dictates what a lot of the movie will be. So when changing the main character changes a ton. So for a lot of screenings, Ian, the main character, loved magic ever since he was a kid. Then by the fourth screening, that flipped. That flipped a lot. And that changed everything because all the scenes we had before that were boarded were based on a character that loved magic. When you flip something like that, the character changes their presence, their journey, their expectations, their acting, their reaction to everything changes. So flipping that changed everything. This is just how the, the reboarding evolving of movies kind of happen. So this is a scene called Conjuring Dad. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. It's, it's a scene that was always gonna happen in one way or another in the movie. It's essentially dad coming back, right? If you've seen the movie, hope you've seen the movie. Uh, and any, in every version of the movie, there's been this version. Uh, oh, there's been a scene like this, but it changes. Details change, plot things change, a lot of things change over time, right? I've boarded three different versions of this movie, of this scene, at least, I think. Uh, and just things change all the time. So I'm gonna hit some boards to you right now. I just kind of a uh, set up to the boards. This is close to what the final version is. And when you look through the, I'm gonna pitch the boards. There's gonna, there's a lot of artists hands in here, actually. Like I've taken boards from, see, from versions that done by other artists that still apply to the scene. And you know, you take things here, there, and other artists kind of, I was primarily story artist on this, but people touch it afterwards a little bit here and there, just to tweak it. So this is close to the version that I made this movie. Uh, so, okay, Ian sits down. Oh, Ian sits down in his chair. <sighs> his little puff. As he looks up at uh, pictures of his father. 
who he misses and he never knew. He looks down at the spell that was supposed to bring him back, but it didn't work. He starts reading it. Only once is all we get. Grant me this rebirth. And he sees this gem and staff that failed earlier start to light up. He's surprised by it. He doesn't know what to think as it lights. He keeps reading the spell. As he keeps reading the spell, it starts to shake and magic starts to lift everything up in the room. The gem and the staff shake even more and it starts to fall and he grasps onto it. Magic surges through it. He finishes the spell as light fills the room, magic fills the room. Swirling chaos as the gem, which is supposed to use to bring back dad, starts to disintegrate and staff. He holds onto the staff really heartily as everything's shaking around. His brother comes in, holy tooth of Zadar. He comes in, he's, uh, Barley comes in. He's like, how did you get it to work? I don't know what happened. As the magic is getting more intense, the dog, Zero comes in, freaks out, rides, runs right out. The magic intensifies as a beam hits forms on the floor. Everything's getting more intense. But then as I see feet forming, <gasps> feet! I get really excited as dad's feet and now legs start forming. Then all of a sudden the magic becomes a lot more chaotic and hard to control. It's shaking too hard for Ian to hold. Dad's kind of like stuttering as you see a uh, picture of father and a fly off. Match is getting so intense it pushes Ian back. Barley sees and runs to help him. I can help! Ian freaks out. Barley no! And pulls his staff away. Gem and magic kind of just explode. The room is all a mess. Boys get up. Ian, are you okay? Now, what happened? I look around. Nothing. Kind of disappointed as I hear noise coming from the closet and look at each other, walk towards it. <gasps> Legs are appearing. Dad? Figure gets up and just like, gah, and they freak out. So the key scene keeps going on, but uh, um, I'm just gonna stop there. Um, and then uh, this is, uh, I just wanna talk about this other scene. This is Dragon High, which is um, the scene that comes near the end of the movie. It's kind of the big epic battle of the movie. Uh, so again, just like every other scene in this movie, this was the process. Uh, not linear, very kind of back and forth, and really messy and chaotic. Uh, and just to show you an example of it, this is an earlier version of the movie, uh, of the scene, and this, is, uh, this isn't fully boarded. This is an earlier version of the, what the scene is going to be, and this is what we call keyboards, which is essentially like a children's book kind of uh, version of the scene. And when you're doing screenings, you have like a regular screening every like few months, and uh, you don't always have time to fully elaborate on everything, especially when you have big changes, right? You kind of want to choose moments, your most important emotional moments to put priority on to board out. So that means you don't always get to board every scene. And this screening and kind of the ending, we hadn't boarded, fully boarded in like a, a long time actually. So this is beat boards, but even though it doesn't get fully boarded, we wanted a representation of that scene of some sort in the screening, just for people to get the idea of what exists there. It'll be elaborated later. So in this version, these are beat boards. It's, there's a lot of similar energy to the final, but it's, uh, there's difference in like details and things like that. So uh, in the final version, there will be a monster that kind of erupts uh, that forms itself out of debris. But in the earlier versions, it wasn't as specific. So um, we had this like rock beast kind of monster thing represented. So these are some drawings I did as B-boards sitting there. 
and a lot of the same elements and ideas were there like it formed out of magic to protect uh the gem i'm spoiling a bunch of stuff if you haven't seen it already and um it would be able to reform itself every time we get blasted and these are this just part of the process of the, uh, the over the process of making the movies all these things that help inform ideas but not necessarily but in different ways like we have different techniques on how to do that stuff so people is kind of one of those ways uh so these are, and using beatboards also like you can get a general sense of what ideas are going to be in the scene without having to do it, you know be as elaborate so it gives the audience like an idea of what's going to happen like this demand for these aspects played into it at certain points but the details changed slightly that was an early version so once we we got into um we started honing in more on the movie. We, we started to use, see that the high school for Ian is where a lot of his problems, angst was the home for a lot of his issues that he was illustrating. So we started, instead of earlier versions where before it was just a rock piece that was kind of created from debris, the idea came up that the high school itself would become the, the monster that Ian like a, it kind of was a metaphor for all of his issues. And once that hit, those details changed, even though some of the ideas stayed, a lot of them had to evolve. So this was uh, kind of a rough design I had started to do when I was boarding. So when I board a scene, I'll need to understand what the characters look like, the, the set looks like and things like that. And art isn't always, hasn't always done stuff for it. So for this particular character, I had to come up with something and talk to the director back and forth and see if he, this is what he had in mind and that kind of thing. So even like, this is, I remember, was the initial thing I had done. And uh, it became more like this, it became more like this. Like the dragon's mosaic, uh, mural on the face was always an idea, but he wanted a more, much more comical uh, expression. So this is how it eventually evolved into, and it's just something I use for reference when I'm boarding. The, the final version looked like much better once like real artists actually got into it. Uh, so this is just coming over, just a rough design, just so I know what to draw in the scene when I'm boarding it, because the designers and the art department didn't get to it yet. But this uh, was done by one of the people in the art department, and this is for me to understand the set. When I'm boarding, uh, it's, Good to understand the set because you will know what how to use the space like i like to know how to use the space what's around and what to draw in the backgrounds actually even when i when i get to boarding so i will call work that's been done already kind of help me inform what um what can you know what i can put in the scene so this is um roughly the same again it's a lot of different people's hands in it even though i was primarily the story artist on it um but a lot of people's hands eventually touch these things every once. So, so this is the scene here. So this set of Farley finds a gem. This is kind of what they've been looking for this whole time. Ooh, you see it shimmer. <gasps> Excited. And Ian with dad kind of runs into the scene. Like looking for Barley. He's like, Barley! Ian, look! He found what they were looking for this whole time. Ian notices behind Barley this red smoke comes out because it's cursed gem. Barley behind you. Looks back as you see this red smoke kind of billow out, out of this fountain that they found the gem in and moves into the school and breaks in. Moving in through all the rooms, kind of like creating a presence out of it in the high school. And it starts also like pulling in just things from around the, the scene. So these segues this didn't make it in either. <laughs> uh, just pulling things towards the school as it starts to come alive. Ground is shaking. The school is rumbling as it starts to lift up. Come alive. It's almost freaking out and it runs off. It breaks off. Parts of it is things pile on top. Oh, geez, what happened? Sorry. A leg forms. 
the skull starts to rise up and form into a beast. Uh, Ian runs towards it as a school as a car as a car runs part, or gets pulled right past him. He looks up as finishes forming. <gasps> Boom! He looks and it's the skull mural face. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm scared. And it's um, kind of surveying around. And it's looking for the gem and kind of spots it in Barley's hand. Starts coming for him. And its job is to guard the gem. Barley, run! Jumps down, grabs the staff, and runs off. It's coming after him. He's freaking out that he has a thought. He takes something out of his pocket that's gem like and throws it off away from him. He's like, you want to get it? Changes the, gets the dragon beast's attention and right comes towards it. Barley reveals, ha-ha, he still has the gem. He threw a decoy, which was his van's tail light. Tricks the dragon. Barley has it and <laughs> comes, dragon comes angry. And shoots fire at the boys. <laughs> separating them. So that's uh, more or less how a lot of that segment of the scene kind of played out at the end after kind of all those years of trying different thoughts and ideas. Uh, that's what I have. Maria. Do, do we take over or do we take some question and do it? I don't know. Oh yeah, we want to do it. Um, I mean, we were gonna, I think we were gonna save the questions for the end, but uh, just a question for Lee before we go into Maria, like how long did it take to get to that that final thing. I mean, you, you can see in the book how many different versions. There was a, a phoenix that was kind of wanted mm -hmm. magic to be over and all this other stuff. I mean, how long from start to finish did it take to get to that finale? To, well, to get to the boarded version or kind of the- kind Yeah, of the yeah, the, the, the boarded version, sure. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, that's such a hard thing. The, the vague answer is years. <laughs> Because you're right, in, in the book, uh, they mentioned the, the phoenix. The phoenix was a version that existed for years also. And uh, in the discussion about the movie, the, the arrival at a monster beast thing in their hometown, which was different from the phoenix, uh, was an effort to, it was a, there was also a plot thing that drove, drove to that. It was also, in an effort to balance more of the mundane, modern, and fantasiness of the movie, so the Phoenix was a little was was more of a fantasy version than this than the the Dragon Beast High School version. So this was arrived at after years of working on the Phoenix because of a note, right, or just a thought, and like just with the the Ian switching was a note. Like he was a kid that loves magic. A note or suggestion, thought was put out like he, maybe he shouldn't like magic at first and eventually learned to love it. Like that note, that thing switched to everything, right? So this is kind of why, you know, this is the, the, the chaotic mess of creativity is you, you can go one way and you think it's going and then some new thought idea comes in and it turns and it turns and it turns and it goes it switches around so that's why it's all you know, squiggling around so i don't have an exact idea when it happened but it happened and i had to board a lot of versions of it or like draw different versions of it do you, do you miss that little conniving phoenix creature I, I miss drawing the phoenix, actually. I drew the phoenix and a lot of beat boards and some boards, too, because uh, the phoenix, she had been in a couple of scenes. But the final ass, final battle scene, I feel like some of it was boarded, actually, by someone else, but uh, and some of it was beat boards, I think. But uh, yeah, I do. I, I do miss aspects of that phoenix, actually. Drawing her was super fun. Awesome. Well, uh, Maria, you want to take over and, and show us your amazing stuff as well? <laughs> yeah, 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 I will show some, let me see, okay, I wanna, okay, 
one second. I'm going to play this post and come back to okay. And use cat. All right. So you guys seeing the character design page, the full screen one? Uh, right? Um, let's see here. What, what, what are you guys seeing? A black screen <laughs> where it says character design. Okay, okay, then I'm good to go. Okay, okay. sorry guys. Okay, let me see. Okay, so yeah, um, I will start with um, my first assignment. Uh, my first assignment was designing sprites and uh, you will see how many variations we are going through till the final design as I'm flipping the images. But at first we are going in the direction where they were super skinny and spiky looking creatures. And let me see. And like uh, everyone, everyone was loving the direction. So we were moving forward to even design the back of their biker jacket and like, like glittery hairs and such. And then, but then like, so then it was moving forward all the way to layout and they learned that they're so tiny in the screen. So it wouldn't work for the story point. So design came back to us. And we redesigned the character to be chunkier and bigger. So this is like a second pass of the same character. So then we can uh, deliver the story uh, it, uh, properly. And then just like the last time, uh, I designed the whole gang of them based on the new direction. But this one also ran into a problem because of the sequence where Barley gets into a fist fight with them. And their head size was way too big compared to Barley's head. So so here we are, the, the third take of this same design where the head size is similar to Barley's. And this one is the, the leader of the gang. And then as you see, it's, it's quite different than the first pass of these creatures. So, which I think uh, something very different about working at the studios than uh, making a short film by, by myself in school because things are always coming up and uh, you kind of have to be flexible when you approach this kind of assignment. So I, I always say like flexibility is the key of success. And then I can uh, talk about the next one where like that. So after I finished the sprites, my second assignment was designing trolls. And then here's another example of how one design goes through multiple directions. So initially we all wanted to have a big headed troll. So I designed a bunch of them all kinds of age and shapes. And then like we were making some conceptual images like this and, and this, and then actually this is not even in the movie, but I could totally see a troll working a DMV in this kind of film. So I went ahead, created an image based on that setup. And of course we do classic lineups like this. And then anyway, so we are going for big headed trolls for a while, but it didn't really work out, so we had to revise the design a bit. So this is like we're, we're going back to like stage one where uh, just like the first time we started over and I started to think about what we could do differently since we cannot have big headed troll. So what we ended up doing is they're playing with the facial proportions so trolls nose could make a big statement when the other facial features are just supporting the design. And this design is actually close to the final look of the trolls in the movie. And then as you see, since we are already deep in the production by this time, so uh, I would design a lineup based on some 3D models that we are already working on instead of just do, doing like a drawings like you guys see earlier. Uh, so I just added this image to show that different state of the design work based on the stage, uh, different stage of the production. And then once again, I will say again, again, flexibility is really the key of success. And then after I finished up Troll, um, I got to design Baby Ian and Barley and the director actually gave, gave me the photo of himself and his brother as a reference. And then, uh, so I thought, oh, maybe it will be actually fun to make a photo album of Baby Ian and Barley instead of doing like a, just, the, just the sketches and drawings. So I went ahead and made, made a little photo album and based on like uh, their memories. And then, like I mentioned earlier, I, I think I find a way to show the image a little differently 
even though that's not in the movies or if even though uh, it's not necessary. Uh, so it can be fun to do and then also it can be fun to look at. So after I finished Baby and in Barley, I got to design the mom and then I kind of want to approach it differently. So sh she's not just a mom character. So I create a bunch of images like this uh, that is, uh, is describing her life that is nothing to do with being a mom. So I tried to capture the moment of her life to explain her personality and then kind of uh, introduce her life a little bit. And like this one, like she's getting ready to go on a date, which isn't really about being a mom. It's just her being herself. And then like this one, she's laughing at some jokes in the image. Uh, and then like what I'm trying to do is like, just capture the personality or like the moment of their life in the in the drawing. So um, so instead of making a pretty something pretty, uh, I try to make the character believable, if that makes sense. And then I'm about to show something which isn't really what character designers do, but I really wanted to make this character believable. So I boarded a scene a little bit. <laughs> And then this is like a date scene between Colt and, uh, and her. And then like the waiter taking the chair away because he obviously don't need a chair. And then they're in a, you know, a romantic dining setup. And then their foods are served. And Colt opened his plate and it's a super vegan organic carrots sauteed with vegetable broth with edible flowers. And then she, uh, the mom opens her plate and it's like a gigantic T-bone steaks with extra mashed potatoes. And then he bites into tiny carrot delicately like, and then while she's really getting into the bite of the steak, right? And then she realized this was a date. And then she's like, uh, and then she's just kind of give an awkward smile. And he's like, whoa. And then he just kind of like find her cute. And then like, their dinner is like going well, obviously. And then I also storyboard entire day of mom as well. That one was just way too long to share it. So I just wanted to just explain it. But uh, what I wanted to do was an uh, interesting different side of her life that you might not get to see in the movie, but thinking about that side of her definitely makes the character believable. So like my two big thing that I wanna say in this whole thing is that, being flexible and don't forget to have fun. But, and then also you don't have to do what others do. You can always find different way to do things if that really helps telling a story. So yeah, that's all for me. Well, before we, we before we get into the, um, the questions that people have shared, both of those presentations were amazing and thank you so much. <laughs> uh, but Maria, I thought uh, it would be cool to talk about how you guys figured out which sort of mythical creatures could be in the movie, because they kind of had to be the same size, right? And then there was this big question of whether or not the living tree could be in the movie, if that was a creature or if that was like background. And it's a fascinating process. And uh, everybody I talked to in the movie sort of had great insight. So I was wondering if, if you could share that and, and Lee, if you have any experience with that as well, um, if you could talk about that too. Uh I mean, I will speak a little about Lee can definitely add. I mean, the one that made it to the film is actually the, the very small selected group of a species or the creatures. Like, we really design <laughs> so many of them, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's going to make it to the film because it has to do a, with, do a lot with story and the budget issue. So. Now I'm gonna toss it to Lee so that you can talk about it. So essentially it's blame story is your answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were, we tried to get the the uh, work, the, the talking trees in for uh, like a long time. And it was for reasons like Maria said, like uh, budget and um, kind of like how a plate, finding a good place for them in the story were the reasons that they ultimately didn't make it, you know. Uh, if there were significantly important, uh, they probably would have made it in at some point, but they were, there weren't a lot of versions of the story where they're like, ah, these have to be in here. So um, if it's not essential, then it's not as, uh, then it's not gonna be as big a priority. 
And there was there was some flexibility there too, if they were all kind of the same size, right? I remember the Tracy Ullman character was like a mermaid at one point. Mm -hmm. I think that was the version maybe that I saw was that she was a, she had a little tank behind the. <laughs> the yeah, she was in a water tank uh, yeah. aquarium thing, and she would I don't know what was it like a hockey stick or something. <laughs> she would use that to to skirt around. But then I guess I would think that was a budgetary resource thing. It's why it became a troll? Goblin? I forget which kind of character. Whatever she was. That. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. What character was she? And, and you guys got some some help on that front from the, the Zootopia team too, right? They kind of helped you in terms of getting this, this kind of world together with all these disparate species. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, told me that. So, right. oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, that was above, that discussion was obviously above my pay grade. I have no idea, <laughs> but uh, you've taught me something about the movie. That I there you go. There you go. Um, so uh, somebody asked, was there ever a version where Ian actually met his father? I think I know the answer to this, but I will let you guys answer. Uh, no, there wasn't. And when I was talking about how the movies evolve and change, there's some things that don't change. And uh, Ian never meeting his father was always the target. That was always a tentpole, and which is, which is great because some movies can take years to kind of figure out their ending. And um, there was a lot of stuff that still needed to get figured out. But Ian letting Barley meet dad was there since uh, screening one. And uh, even the drawings, I think some of the drawings that were done of that meeting just kept living. Because like as you redo movies again, like drawing scenes, panels, they all like thrown out to be replaced by new ones. But uh, some of those first early drawings in the boat pressing, they were there from screening one all the way to screening eight. Uh, because oh, it was always- Who likes my floating? And I heard that that was sort of a North Star for the production because you guys had that ending that people said, okay, we'll, we'll figure out the story. Uh, yeah. and, and that that helped a lot in sort of getting the, the movie going and also keeping the movie on track because you always had that as a North Star, right? Yeah, I mean, that's really helpful in storytelling is knowing where you're gonna go. Knowing where you're gonna go because you, uh, you start shaping things towards that ending. And uh, you start shaping the characters, transformation towards that ending. So again i said earlier like a lot of movies don't have they don't know what their ending is they're they're looking for it all the time so that makes setting out the the tent poles towards it complicated but we always knew what that was so we always had to figure out versions of things with the general sense that got us there um this is for both of you guys um before designing the characters environments does the team have a general style direction like a design language that all the artists follow? Uh, or are you free to experiment in that regard? Oh, uh, uh, I, I guess I cannot say everything for sure because how the time I was on this show is like, uh, how would I say? So we had a art director and then we got to the point where it's like, all the way to like we started modeling the main character and then that's the time I, I I got on it and then we had a dramatic shift there where we changed the art director not because there's something wrong with it it's just the the, the, the previous art director wanted to go for different uh, opportunities so she, he left the studio and then now we had a new art director and then I will say when you have a new art director there is a that's the chance where you kind of able to like shift the style a little bit so uh but then it didn't go too too far uh so usually uh art directors and production designers most likely set up the uh, i would say the, the 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 design language of the of the movie and then uh, people who was like a more on the supporting role individuals try to follow that that language but there, there, there is always a little bit of wiggle room where you can kind of break out of it based on the characters. So it depends. But then main characters and then like family, 
like those like a direct family or like the one that who has a screening time more than 20 percent they should look they should kind of follow the the main style because because you want the film to be uh as a as a whole instead of like like a different character from different world yeah and at one point the the characters were really stylized right like they were almost like they were very graphic um yeah yeah can you talk about how that transition happened and and why that happened because i'm not sure if many people know about that story um i mean it's always a mix of reasons i think this is a not like a human character so in a perfect world that like, yes uh, we will have like uh, all kinds of uh, uh, scales and then like uh, designs at some point like super super early like even before the time I was on like I would see like a character lineup and then all you see is the legs we never really even get to see what's above like you know but then uh, but then like we at the end like we think about like okay that's fun to look at but is it helping the storytelling like uh, how much of it is like can we we could actually build it and then make it fun to look at for like a two second in the background but or we can do that to actually help what actually matters you know so a lot of decision is made based on that kind of a, a understanding so at the at the end we just kind of like figure out what is the most uh, efficient way to help and support the story. So yeah, we do have to kill a lot of fun ideas because at the end is a, it's a storytelling, not necessarily show how many cool designs we got. And yeah. Right. Um, so this is a question that is, was it always the intention for the entire world being a copy of a Dungeons and Dragons style manual? it's unique that they use that as a nature manual instead of a game book. And I think that, I mean, uh, Lee can talk to talk about this, but the idea was that, that it was based on uh, historical fact, like a lot of these sort of role-playing games are based on, right? And Lee, were you part of the spell check, the, the, the spell uh, organization that came up with the different? Uh, no, in, okay. the, in the spectrum of people that loved loved fantasy on the story team i was a little on the less experienced spectrum side of it so and there was a handful that was like really into uh fantasy and dungeons and dragons i've dipped my toe but uh these people like dove in the pool several times so they um they were part of this group that you're talking about that was kind of like the task force for <laughs> For, for the fantasy aspects of it. Because uh, also on top of like Dan, director, he didn't come into it knowing a ton about fantasy necessarily, right? He had to, uh, he had to learn uh, and pick up a lot in the kind of process of making this movie. Uh, so you know, leaning on people that are already kind of super into it, it's super helpful for him and the structure of the movie. But the uh, the d and ness I think early versions because in the final version, there's the game. Quest of Yore was a game, right? And uh, in the early versions, gosh, I think I'm right about this. There wasn't a game. It wasn't, uh, no, it wasn't a game. There was no like D&D &D game that they just kind of structure the, the mythology around. And you're right, like in this world, D&D &D is like, uh, like, D, like LARPing is like Civil War reenactment in this world. It's all that stuff. but. Uh, the template of that started to happen shoot I don't know, later screenings uh once the game started and it really helped also because so much of uh the movie is setting up the rules or explaining the rules in some, some aspect the magic rules and uh setting it setting it up with using the game kind of created this way barley could explain things to ian without just saying that he's just explaining things. It's all part of this game that he understands and which is ex also explains the world. So yeah, to answer that question, it wasn't always there, but uh, eventually was. Uh, somebody says, I've heard that the, the final story screenings onwards, the character interactions were pretty rock solid and set in stone. Were there any standout moments for either of you uh, that animation plussed beyond the animatic or storyboard 
and were really fresh and exciting for you guys who worked on it to see? I, I think Lee should answer this because uh, he knows the story <laughs> more part of it. I, I don't really have all the information about it. <laughs> both answer this question, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you start. Maybe you spark some idea for me. Spark some ideas. Uh, let me think. The, oh, that's so hard. Um, the van actually there's a lot of cool stuff in the van i know there's a lot of cool stuff so i'm just trying to like focus in on one answer the van is given a lot of personality in animation in the how it i know it's just the van but you think you know but we wanted it to have personality we wanted it to feel like a steed even though it was a van right we wanted we wanted uh, ultimately to fall in love with it so when we lose it it meant something so but a lot of the personality was working in the van, like how it moved and how like junky it, it was. And uh, a lot of those ideas were set in the boards, but the details and the granular textures of that stuff really kind of uh, really brought it to a different life level of life. And I know it's weird, you probably didn't expect me to talk about the van, <laughs> but um, that scene where it you know, gets smashed up becomes emotional because even though it's just the van but you know like all the work story uh animation all the pulled together and created this thing that wasn't doesn't you know it's not really alive but you mourn for it like it was so i guess guinevere the van big van guy lee is um yeah, a huge <laughs> van guy i'm in a van right now <laughs> you look at it. yeah um so uh, somebody asked, what character do you most identify with in the film? This is for both of you guys, obviously. Man, I don't know. <laughs> Manticore, maybe? Like, it lines up with my personality the most. But Oh, I like this that's question. How, <laughs> <laughs> that's how far I can go. I'm not going to explain all the details, but yes. <laughs> oh, tell me later. I want to hear it. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, it's the van, actually. It's the van. No, it's not the van. Uh, <laughs> I guess maybe it's Ian, I guess, in some aspects of it. Um, that aspect of trying to control chaotic world. Feel that. I feel that in me a little. Um, somebody asked, what was your favorite scene to create, or I guess to work on um, in the movie? That's for you, Lee. Maria, you worked on the, I mean, yeah, what, there, would no, there would not be the fairies yeah, without I know. you. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> but it, like, I'm, I'm not really like in, in, involved in creating a scene. I mean, I, I will always make a fake scene that is not in the movies. Like the, the, the dating dinner I show you guys, but like, uh, It's not true. I Every scene know. is a com com combination of everyone's kind of departments and talents. Just imagine that whole chase sequence without your fairies. There would it would be ridiculous. <laughs> <That's you know? true. laughs> so <laughs> the budget yeah, would be cheaper. Uh, it's invisible. Yeah. yeah. That's true. I don't know. I mean this is a kind of a random, but I always like to see giant character in the shot. Like so uh, when I see giant trolls like, you know, it gets me excited about it. <laughs> it's such a weird answer, <laughs> but <laughs> but like you know, because like those kind of thing is like such a clear thing. Oh, this is not like the normal setting when you see that kind of stuff. So, or or norms too. Like they're so tiny, and then like it's obviously far from the reality that we we experience every day. So, you know, that's like a fun thing about being a character designer, where you can kind of get out of the, the what you see every day a little bit. For for me. I did a lot of scenes over the years that just got cut <laughs> so often that like, they would joke they would joke about it they would call it a lee do because they would just do a scene and they would just get cut so a lot of fun scenes i remember doing were scenes that got cut actually like you brought up the phoenix drew earlier and like i really like drawing that phoenix actually it was really fun and kind of exploring like there were different versions of her personality there was like a much more whimsical uh, like, ooh, <laughs> version of her at some early on. And then uh, eventually I did a much uh, 
darker gravitas version of her. Um, and I really like enjoying that scene, but you know, as is how our process goes, a lot of that stuff is uh, cut to build a stronger version of the movie. Did you work on the mall sequence? I worked on part of the mall sequence. Yes, I did work on the mall sequence. Actually, is this in the book? Does the word Minotaur mean anything to you? Yeah, it's in, yeah, it's in the book. Okay. Do you wanna, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, that was a fun scene too. There was a scene in the movie that got Lee dude, <laughs> where uh, there was a Minotaur chase in a mall. The mall was a labyrinth, like uh, you know, like Daedalus's labyrinth. Drew, if you have if you have the book with you, you can hold it up to the camera. I don't <laughs> have it with me. Uh, oh. So don't don't put me on the spot like that, Ben. Is all I'm going to say. Um, I don't know. I thought you. I will say that there's an image in the book of there's an image in the book of sort of right. Escher stairs, but they're all uh, escalators, right? Yeah, there were very, there was a lot of artwork done. The mall existed for a long time too. A lot of screenings actually. Um, and uh, at a certain point, after it existed for a while, there was the idea of there being the boys being chased by a Minotaur, and this was around, this is after the fourth screen. This is our four and a half screen here. I remember boarding this because I was exhausted doing it because it was a big chase scene. And uh, it was a lot of fun actually, it was really fun. And how I played into it or constructed it was kind of just thoughts. It wasn't necessarily like, this is supposed to happen. This is gonna happen necessarily, this is gonna happen. It was like different ideas that happened to the boys in the scene, pitch those. And as a team, we called it and figured out uh, what, what like people liked, what didn't they really like, and uh, and then I boarded it, and it was this big monstrous minotaur chasing the boys through the small, and uh, had <laughs> jokes and action, and and it was it was a big scene, and uh, things like that, like the mall got cut altogether. So like those hundreds of boards. I mean, there was a, did you have a statistic how many boards? There was like 97 boards that were delivered for this movie. Is that in the book? Oh, no, I read that in an article about the, the movie. It was like 97. Yeah, there's the movie. Uh, it was like 97,000 panels were delivered for the movie. So we've boarded more versions of the movies that the world hasn't seen than, than has seen. So that was kind of one of those fun Lee do things that weren't seen by people. Can you both talk about the um, the ratio of the fantasy to the familiar and how that informed both of your roles on the movie? Because it was it was like 70% familiar, 30% fantasy, right? It was sort of the, the working numbers that you guys had, right? Do you want to come around? Do you want me to go? <laughs> Um, wait, are you muted? You're talking, Maria. I don't know if I can hear you. No one can hear you, Maria. Is this a joke? Are you playing a joke? She's, uh, she's not muted. Now she's muted. Huh? There, there you go. go. There we go. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting for art. I think in the beginning, we did a lot of uh, like a full magical, all kinds of crazy ideas that, that happens in every movie it's like beginning of the film when it's more on the development stage we throw all the crazy ideas and and then when the story is getting moving forward we trim it down a little bit and then on trio in my experience we trim down quite a lot at some point so we have to find the magical elements later on in the production when we actually getting close to see the final look of it. I'm like, oh, it's not magical enough. <laughs> so like oh. we dig through it and they're looking for opportunity to maybe we can make this part more whimsical. Maybe we can make this part more crazier than before. And then in some way, like uh, I think they, some people need to see how far they go one or the other. For, for them to see the uh, balance. And then in my opinion, like our job is to like help them find the balance, but by creating a library of images because it, sometimes they cannot really tell without seeing the seeing the, the image of it. So 
but the, I I would say a lot of up and down for the ratio wise. It wasn't like always mm -hmm. stable. Yeah. Right. And because uh, I was on the movie earlier than Maria was, and the movie earlier, yeah, it was like what she was, she was saying. It, it was kind of blue sky. Things get a little more blue sky earlier on, meaning that it's kind of open. And we, uh, they had as earlier versions where it was like the, the balance was different. It was like lean much more into fantasy at some points. And I don't know the specific ratio at all, but it was always, you know, like with the, these things, it's how does it feel? You know, it's all, a lot of it's based on a feeling like, and, and, and a lot of that's dictated by the director, like, you know, we, and how, what he, you know, we all have our tastes and things and his, his, his informs what the movie is and like how balanced he wanted was, uh, you know, that evolves over time. So I don't know the exact number that you threw out, Drew, 70, 30. This is what is. people tell me. This is what people tell me. <laughs> You know what I mean? hey, you know what I mean? I, yeah, maybe. Uh, it's true. But it's just for me, it's like we feel we feel our way through it and you know for years and then see where it ends up, I guess. Uh somebody asked uh from working on onward, what new directions are you excited to see Pixar taking in the future in terms of storytelling and design? Perhaps informed by uh, Mr. Doctor uh taking over the studio as well. I know you can't talk about anything specific because a lot of these things are still not announced yet, but um, maybe just broadly, uh, does it feel like it's, it's sort of a different time at Pixar now in terms of taking these, these uh, chances? It's, it's different. It's definitely different. I, there's a way more exciting, uh, exciting show coming up. Uh, we do take uh, diversity very seriously being inclusive, that kind of thing. Now, Trio kind of opened up the door and then now every single film we work on, we cannot not think about it. It's heavily uh, impacting our decision making. So that's the one thing I am excited about. And then just visually, like I think we got to the point, like we are really good at what we've been doing. Let's try something we are not so comfortable. And then that's kind of the what we are heading to. I think that's not me spoiling anything much, but it's quite, <laughs> that's that, as an individual, I, I'm hopeful about it. I'm going to pass on that question. I'm going to pass on that question. No, um, uh, we, we have a lot of new leadership. Uh, a lot of the old leadership that started Pixar have left and uh, with new leadership, creative leadership, uh, it's just new ideas, right? New kind of, again, you know, like everyone has taste. So it's just, it's, an, and it's, it's a different time too, like Julia said, like we are trying as a studio to evolve and uh, help, you know, the world uh, and, you know, be supportive in ways that, you know, have not been as, uh, has been lacking a little bit in the world, right? So, um, that in and of itself is going to inform the decisions, the creative decisions we make. It's on top of new people having new thoughts and new ideas and uh, new kind of tastes play in. That is, that, those, those are such great answers, guys. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have been afraid. Uh, Who asked that, that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're almost at time. Uh, let me see if there's another question I can grab. Um, here's a good one. How, what are your experiences with fandom? How about that? Just do people come up to you and ask you advice? I mean, do they talk to you about the movies? Are you recognized ever? What is your experience <laughs> with fandom? As we, as we sit here on Comic-Con weekend, uh, what, what was that like for you? I, I mean, I'm I'm more on the art side, so like I I will share my work on social media, all this stuff. So like, there's a lot of uh, excitement, which I am start to getting used to it because this is like kind of a first movie I did at Pixar. So I I didn't know till like now where oh there's a really like a serious fans coming in and then like like it, it is very exciting. And then uh, uh, I I. I don't know how, how I, sometimes like 
they're like super hardcore and then I'm like oh okay <laughs> but like, I'm, I'm kind of like look at it as oh they're just just very excited so and then uh, I, I'm glad that I can just like do something that makes people that excited I, I think I'm still getting used to it I'm still uh, understanding oh wow like you know yeah, to answer the question about are we ever recognized no we're not <laughs> <laughs> recognize because uh, you know we're behind the scenes people yes. you know yeah. that kind of thing you know I mean these things take hundreds of people like that's why the credit lists are so long right? uh, but like fandom of the movie I, I guess Pixar uh, uh, Onward was also my first Pixar movie um, but uh, you know you don't really I couldn't really understand the capacity of like how big uh, audience Pixar fans is like a and fantasy fans so you kind of smash those two together that's a huge group of people <laughs> huge group of people so um you get every once in a while like you know I still get hit up on Instagram and send pictures and sometimes I'll go looking for people's like versions of stuff in of the movie and some's not family friendly but whatever but uh but it's you know like people care about it right and like they're you know when people are passionate about something and excited about something like that's all good like i'm not gonna poo poo on any of that stuff yeah it's two very vocal very passionate fan bases coming yeah, together coming together yeah. um before we go i can i don't think lee we cannot talk about what you are working on because it is very far in the future but you're still at pixar you're still doing amazing yes. things um maria can you talk about what you're uh working on or no we're on the same show okay we'll have yeah. this chat in about four years uh and we yeah we'll we'll come back and and do it on the next one but um thank you guys mm -hmm. both so much and thank you for all of your questions and Obviously, we'll get, we're, we're signing the books uh, now, and we'll get those out to everybody that uh, pre-ordered them. And you can watch Onward on digital HD, Blu-ray, uh, 4K, and also Disney+. Plus. So if you have not seen Onward, or if you want to see Onward again, please go do that now. And um, Ben, thank you so much for, for having us. Thank and you thank you. Thanks, thanks, everybody, for watching. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your, your Saturday. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye. Now the awkward seeing everyone leave portion of the Zoom meeting. <laughs>